see you all here in a beautiful fall day. Glad that the uh, the Bengals are playing today to kick off this forum series. Uh, I think that's how it happens. Um, and glad they are kicking off a little bit later, so I can get down now. Um, so I'm Katie Hines. I'm with the Center for Community Change, but I live here in Cincinnati, so I've been involved in many things here in Cincinnati. Most, a lot of you in the room I know and have worked with in various and different ways. Um, but presently, I'm on the Housing Trust Fund team at the Center for Community Change. And I can talk more about the Center for Community Change later. If anybody is interested, uh, a long 40 plus, so almost 50 year history of uh, working for low income people, people of color on a national level. It started after the assassination of Bobby Kennedy and um, his work around bringing uh, people of poverty into the national debate. So that's where our history comes out of. And housing has actually been um, part of the center for a huge period of time, since the early 80s, um, nearly 40 years, so almost all the history in the center working on housing trust funds. Um, and that's what I'm gonna dig in today. But before I go into that, um, I just want you to, Think about why we work on affordable housing or why we work on um, anti-poverty issues in general and um, and also think of a place when you think of the word home what do you think of what comes to mind when you think of the word home <coughs> anybody have a good job the word home 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 where you hang your hat. Anybody <laughs> else? It's a safe place. Safe place. Anybody else? Home. Oh. Shelter from the elements. Shelter? Family. Family. Right? So home are all these things. And home, I would say, the reason we do housing trust fund work is because we want a place for people to call home, a safe, affordable place. It's a place where we all value, a place where we grow up, a place where we can grow old. So home is more than just affordable housing and affordable units of housing. Matter of fact, we always say we don't want, we're never talking about units, we're talking about people, or we're talking about homes, because we can all relate to that. Um, so that's an important piece just to kind of think of because we get really wonky when we talk about housing, because this has to do with money, and so it can be very, there's all these ways to do affordable housing that we've made really super complicated. Um, but one important piece is all those complications are made by people, um, not by ordained from above. So um, these are all things we can change. So the, the Center for Community Change Housing Trust Fund project works with people locally and in the state to work on housing trust funds. Right now, predominantly. We work on a little bit more beyond that on housing. Um, we touch a lot of other things. We do organizing of residents in California and Washington State, for example. But we work and have been working for 40 years, nearly or 30 years, I mean, on housing. Well, since the 80s, whatever the math is. <laughs> um, and so, one other question I have for you all is um, when you Think about housing. Does anybody in the room know somebody, or um, you perhaps yourself have been affected by housing instability and eviction and or homelessness? How many people in the room know somebody or have had that kind of experience themselves? If they know somebody's had housing problems, yeah. So a lot of the people in the room know what it's like to not have a safe, warm place to call home, whether it's yourself or somebody you know or care about in your community. Um, and one of the reasons we're talking about this now and in Cincinnati, I like to pace around and uh, this gets in the way of moving this thing. So um, one of the things, an important piece on Cincinnati, um, a campaign that Josh is going to bring up later, but just an important, I think, um, national trend. And of course, before I came to this, my PowerPoint uh, froze on my computer, so I don't have my notes. So I'm going to look over here, so excuse me for like Turn it away, the audience. Um, but we want to talk about ballot initiatives that just passed recently, which shows the need and the the, um, the what people in the community would do for housing, for affordable housing, to tax themselves for affordable housing. So a place like Vancouver, Washington, 
which is a conservative uh, town north of Portland, Oregon. So there, it's where all the more conservative folks live outside of the weird Portlanders, right? So they passed a levy for 57% of the vote to tax themselves for $42 million affordable housing trust fund. Um, Massachusetts has 11 different uh, mellet, um, measures on the ballot, but three counties in California around the Bay Area tax themselves and they had to pass that tax by over 66%. That's the rule in California if you tax yourself. They tax themselves 66% or more of the voters for $2 billion worth of housing, affordable housing money to come to that area. We all know that's a huge area of need and crisis with affordable housing when we look around the country, but that's a, that's a yeah, yeah, that's true. But the people who live there are willing to tax themselves to make this happen. And there's more. I won't go into all of them. There are a bunch of ballot initiatives that are passed since the past few years from Seattle, Washington, Vancouver, uh, I mean, yeah, Seattle, Washington, Vancouver, but even in uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan, this is past year, people taxed for themselves around homeless housing for homeless families. So my point, the need, the, um, it's the time is now. People are interested in this. Now it's the time to get the political will of politicians, whether it's a campaign traditionally or a campaign of a ballot initiative, to realize that people are waking up and smelling this issue. So quickly, there's 770 housing trust funds across the country. So we started out in the 80s and it have exponentially grown until now. So that's a lot of housing trust funds. Almost every state has one, all but the three in White, so Mississippi, Wyoming, Alaska do not have a state housing trust fund. Every state has a trust fund in it, except for Wyoming. So like a city housing trust fund or a county housing trust fund. So many places have this, and it doesn't matter whether you're a red state, blue state, purple state, it doesn't matter. People who pass housing trust funds are not, it's not a Democrat Republican issue many times. South Dakota just passed a housing trust fund with a State Housing Trust for the last couple of years with a majority of you know, all the offices similar to Ohio were Republican run and the Republican governor put it on to get you know, the legislative agenda and they passed a housing trust fund in the state of uh, South Dakota. So it's important that we don't look at housing trust funds as being a partisan issue. It's, a, it's across the board, as housing should be. Um, other new trust funds that have happened in the past um, year is uh, Denver, Colorado <coughs> just passed a $150 million over 10 year housing trust fund. Um, whoops. And Benjamin Vancouver, Portland, Oregon just started their housing trust fund there. Uh, Pittsburgh and Baltimore both have trust funds that are waiting to get the uh, funding source. They're working on that right now. And then these are the other ones, some of which I mentioned that just recently, the past year, and then not even including the ballot initiatives I mentioned. This is just campaigns. So, what are housing trust funds? Housing trust funds are a great way to provide funding for affordable housing on a local level and a state level because they can be super flexible. Meaning that if you work in housing or if you work in any kind of service, you have all these kind of mandates to meet. Housing trust funds can be done by us here in the city, in the county, in the state. Ohio, by the way, for those of you the state of Ohio does have a housing trust fund. Um, one of the models in the country. Um, but there are three major pieces of a housing trust fund that every one of them must have, in our opinion, to be a, a true housing trust fund. Um, a dedicated revenue source, a dedicated public revenue source. That could come from any ways that you could be creative about, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, administration that is done probably through the kind of public body, and then having an oversight board from the uh, general public. And then programs that are flexible and to the needs of what's in that community. Um, the best thing about housing trust funds, if you work in housing at all, you know, maybe, for those of you who don't, that a lot of the housing, low-income housing dollars, unless they're Section 8 vouchers or public housing, all that other talk about housing goes to people at the middle of the lower income. They go to low-income people, there's a need, but the very low-income people do not get served. So seniors, people on fixed income, um, people who are working but at very you know, low wage jobs, um, larger families, those folks cannot, are not being able to be served because of the way we set up the rules, not because of the water and the desire of the housing developer necessarily. It's how we set up the rules. And we meaning the, our whole big government. 
not just people in this room, or me. Um, it would be different if it was me. Um, so dedicated revenue source, why? Why is this important? And this is really important when we go to talk to our city and county officials because people, you know, money gets to be the hard, the hardest part of the campaign is, is the money because um, it shows where our priorities are. You all know that, you come to these forums. So having two things, if private market, if it was gonna do it, would have done it a long time ago, it's never gonna do it. It's never going to do it. Talk to Jerry Brown in California, please, and tell him the private market will never, no matter how much zoning you change, no matter how fast you make buildings go up, the private market is about profit, and it will not serve people who are not going to make them profitable. The other piece is that if we have a, a dedicated source of funding, those who are doing housing know from year to year how and what to plan for, and we as a community can also know what to plan for. And uh, Liz Bloom is, they had done that report about the 40,000 homes, the, the gap for very low income people. Um, and so we could actually get a plan for that. If we had funding, we knew it was gonna come over time. And it's not the whim, if it's dedicated, of political wins. So what are the ways that we do the funding? So the, for the most part, there's a lot, you can do whatever you wanna do. You can fund this in however creative ways you want to. Many places do different way, ways. Um, the major way that um, cities do it are in the black. So impact and linkage fees, um, inclusionary zoning fees, um, which are for those who don't do housing development. If you're gonna, city or the county's gonna give a bunch of money to a developer or land or resources of us as a public, that they have to do a certain portion of that should be low income. And if they choose not to, there's an amount of money they must pay into a fund. Um, property taxes. The counties are the biggest use is document recording fees. That's what our state does as well here in Ohio. Uses a document recording fee and all the counties goes to the state housing trust fund. But that doesn't mean you can't do anything else. Um, you know, you could do any of these kinds of things and people are creative. I think one that's not in this list that's become more interesting to people like short-term rental um, fees, especially in 